Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the NWA Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another exciting episode of NucleCast. Of course, I am your host, Adam Wilder, and today we have a great guest for you. You may know him by his written works. Of course, that is Dan Poneman. He is the president and CEO of Centris Energy, but he's also, he's been at the National Security Council. He was a senior official in the Department of Energy. He is at the Belfort Center. He has written widely on nuclear issues, climate change, and a host of other issues, and we are fortunate to have him on today. And, you know, honestly, Dan, I didn't, I wanted to talk about more narrow topics, but as we were talking before the show, you've written and done so much that I think we're going to just jump around today. Jump ahead. Well, thanks glad for- to be here, and, and thanks so much for inviting me. Well, so let's, let me ask one question to sort of take us back in time and you were at the NSC uh, at the end of the cold war and you were there to working nuclear issues at a time when the United States saw the Soviet threat disappear. And uh, you know, we, we saw that there was this opportunity for a peace dividend. What was going on and what was the thinking like at the white house at that time. I have a vivid memory of this period, Adam. The word that first comes to mind is hemorrhage. (laughs) There was a deep concern across the White House, across the government, I think across academia, that the breakup of the Soviet Union would be a major setback for nuclear nonproliferation. First, you were going to have four, count them, four nuclear weapon states instead of one. Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, uh, and Ukraine. And second, there were thousands of scientists who had worked on nuclear weapons program. The fear was they would show up in Iran, North Korea, wherever. Third, you had tens of thousands of weapons. Fourth, you had a bunch of fissile material, both plutonium and 90% high-enriched uranium. That was also uh, a concern of leakage to bad actors, including terrorists. And so this whole cluster of issues was of high, high uh, importance. President Bush was personally focused on it. National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft. Deputy Robert Gates, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, There were a whole host of people working on that at the State Department, Secretary Baker, Dennis Ross. And we started an effort, which we called, uh, you know, you chuckle, but it was we were concerned about the hemorrhage of brains, technology and material all over the world, creating bombs everywhere. And we put together a whole host of efforts, which I was proud and still am proud to have been a part of to try to contain that threat. And the last footnote to tell you is the general two-star general put in charge of that very focused effort was General Bill Burns, who was the late, he, great man. He passed away. He's the father of the current CIA director, Bill Burns. Uh, and, and so now that you look back, you know, I don't know if I, I this is one thing I didn't tell you, but um, sort of my um, passion that I perform on the side is, is I'm a purveyor of hindsight. I don't know if I had told you that it's a superpower of mine. Yeah. So I, I use my hindsight superpowers to look back and tell people that they got things right or wrong. And, you know, I, now that, you know, you've had some time to, you know, look back at what y'all did at the white house at that time, as you look back using my superpower that I've, I've gifted you during this episode, what do you think about what you did? What'd you get right? What'd you get wrong? 
I'll tell you, uh, I've been actually, Adam, thinking a lot about this lately. Uh, I'm glad to have the added enhancement of your superpowers of hindsight. <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you what. So uh, what I think we got right is I think we're right to focus on this as a problem. Um, I think we were right to get Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan to relinquish their actual weapons. I think we got wrong, candidly speaking, uh, the level of assurance that we gave, in particular Ukraine, mm. that in sacrificing the weapons, the security assurance that they picked up in Budapest would suffice. Obviously, it has not sufficed. So I think in retrospect, I'm not sure how we would have should have handled it. But by definition, it didn't work. Right. Right. I think we got right. There was a thing called the International Science and Technology Center that gave, I think, well over 10,000 scientists a peaceful a meaningful technical work, not helping Iran and North Korea build bombs. I think we got that right. Um, I was personally responsible for a couple of things. Uh, one was called materials protection, control and accounting in improving just perimeter security and portals and so forth uh, in a very vulnerable set of uh, institutions around the former Soviet Union. I think we got that right. And then here's the one that's most complicated and I think most interesting right now, because the Ukraine war has brought this home in a big way. Uh, when it comes to what to do with all of those tons and hundreds of tons of bomb grade material, with support from both President Bush and President Clinton, we persuaded Russia to give up 500 metric tons of 90% pure high enriched uranium from the arsenal and blend that down from 90% pure down to 4 or 5% what's called low enriched uranium that can't make a bomb but can produce energy and electricity, that was 20,000 bombs worth of HEU. And I think most people believe, I believe, that was the most powerful nonproliferation program in history. 20,000 bombs worth turned into electricity. And in fact, when you think about it, Adam, at that point, and even now, 20% of the nation's electricity in the United States comes from nuclear. Half of the commercial nuclear fuel for 20 years came from that deal. So that math would tell you one in 10 light bulbs in America used to be in a warhead pointing at an American city, city and American citizens. So that's huge. Um, the hindsight in terms of law of unintended consequences is it didn't have to be this way, but it did lull the nation into complacency. And therefore, the three massive uranium enrichment plants that we had built during the Cold War that provided all of our national security requirements for naval reactors, for weapons, and provided like 90% of the world's commercial enriched uranium, which brings all the US nonproliferation standards with it, we allowed all three of them over time to shut down. We never replaced them. And guess what happened? The United States had 27 million what's called separate work units of enrichment capacity. And now in terms of domestic technology, we have zero. Guess what? Russia has 27 million SWU. And guess what? Russia now has 46% of the world's installed base to enrich uranium. And guess what? People were allowed to just kind of rely uh, complacently on that supply, thinking all would be well in the world until Ukraine. Now everybody wants to get off of the junk, so to speak. And we got a problem because you can't go like and have an enrichment plant appear. It's going to take, you know, six years ish to to replace that capacity. So in hindsight, uh, we allowed ourselves to be lulled into a quite foolish, short sighted complacency that's as bad, if not worse, that the Europeans did when it comes to uh, Russian natural gas. Now, you sort of offered the perfect segue into a discussion about centrists and what y'all are doing because as i understand it and we've here on nuclecast we you know we have a mix of sort of talking defense related work and then talking nuclear power and in the past we've had a couple of guests who have come on and talked about this need to enrich uranium but you guys are primarily focused on that effort and on uh, building the technologies and new technologies and this is one of the things that as I've gotten smarter about nuclear power, when we're talking about micro reactors and we're talking about the technologies that w if we were to build new nuclear today in this country for power, the technologies, it's, it's almost like um, 
you know, the difference between the cars we drive now versus the cars that the Cubans are driving. Just the technology is completely different from, you know, any of the accidents that people, you know, have fears of, that it's, it's not even close to the same. So as we think about uranium enrichment, which is all a part of this larger nuclear industry, what's going on and where are we headed in the years to come? Yeah. Um, I wish I had your uh, hindsight uh, uh, trick to (laughs) help me with my foresight. But just for those who don't know and who have perhaps never heard of Centris Energy Corp., the first name of Centris Energy Corp. was the Manhattan Project. Literally, the effort in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to invent the technology that won World War II, it won the Cold War, it defended our nation, it defended our allies, it deterred our adversaries, it fueled our submarines, it fueled our arsenal, it fueled our carriers. All of that was done by government. And after the Manhattan Project went away, it was done by the Atomic Energy Commission. And after the Atomic Energy Commission went away and split into the regulatory body now known as Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the other body now known as the Department of Energy, there was a decision taken in two uh, steps to privatize this activity. Just think about that. We should use your hindsight test on that one. Uh, No other nation in the world has ever privatized the activity to enrich uranium, not surprisingly, because you're going to use it to make nuclear weapons. But that was taken uh, in 1992. The first step was taken to turn it into a government corporation. In 1998, there was an IPO and it was privatized. And after Fukushima, the company was not able to survive that transition because the market collapsed after right. Fukushima because the demand collapsed and uh, and it was reorganized. So, so why am I telling you all this? So what that meant is when I told you a few minutes ago, Adam, that we ended up with zero, exactly zero nuclear enrichment plants in the United States for a number of years, all we could do. And indeed, our principal business today is in brokering between existing suppliers and existing customers for this enriched uranium. The exciting thing, to answer your question directly, what's happening now is because to your uh, pick up your analogy to uh, Cuban cars versus modern cars, there's a whole new generation of what's called fourth generation nuclear power plants. And these have much higher power density and a lot of very attractive attributes compared to conventional light water reactor fuel that is familiar to most people and is the fuel that's used in the 92 commercial reactors still operating. These uh, reactors, for example, because they might use liquid metal to cool so they can operate at ambient pressure. So the risk of a hydrogen explosion goes away. Um, They can have very, very small footprints. They have uh, very strong nonproliferation characteristics. And one of the very interesting things is they can produce very high temperature heat. And therefore, like a a gas cooled reactor, such as uh, X Energy has, can produce high temperature heat that can then be used for industrial processes. That's a big deal when it comes to climate change because electricity is only 27% of carbon emissions. So we've got to decarbonize industrial processes. So there was an announcement by Dow Chemical and X Energy. Uh, the, the, there are other applications. So TerraPower, which uses liquid uh, sodium as a coolant, which is a metal, uh, they can actually un- run 724. And when you don't need to feed electrons to the grid, they can heat molten salt that can backstop renewables. So there's lots of attractive features. All of these fourth generation reactors require this very uh, new kind of fuel called high assay, low enriched uranium. If you think about it, you pull uranium ore out of the ground, less than 1% is the fizzle isotope uranium-235. That's the one that splits chain reaction heat release. You take that enrichment level up to three, four, five percent you get a light water reactor you take it up to 90%, you get a naval reactor in a very small package. And right, the dividing line between low and high is 20%. So if you want to have all of the attributes of the enhanced performance, but you don't want to get all the regulatory uh, burden of a higher enrichment, which has weapons implications, you go to 19.75%. We have the only Nuclear Regulatory Commission license to produce HALU. The only source of HALU commercially in the world today is Russia. And therefore, we at Centris are very excited to support this whole new generation of reactors. The Advanced Reactor Program at the Department of Energy picked nine designs to support, including two big demo reactors. They picked 10. Of those 10, nine require this new special kind of fuel that we are in a unique position at Centris to provide. 
We did this under a cost share contract with the Department of Energy. We built 16 machines. You can see them on our website. And later this year, this will be the first new U.S. technology production of enriched uranium from a new facility in 70 years. So that's something. That's something. And we're very <laughs> excited about it. And in terms of, you know, as for me as somebody who's, you know, I write about uh, the nuclear enterprise quite a bit. And, you know, as I think back to our enrichment processes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a, a point at which during the height of the Manhattan Project that Oak Ridge, as it was enriching, was consuming, you know, a quarter of the nation's power. It was some, un, you know, some ungodly number that when you saw it, you're like, wow, that was for one facility. And so I would assume the technology now which admittedly I'm not familiar with is a much more efficient way to enrich. Could you talk about that process now? You have put your finger right on it because that old technology that you're remembering was called gaseous diffusion. And it took humongous amounts. I'd heard 10% of the nation's electricity. Any way you look at it, it's a lot. And shoving this uh, gas uh, with the uranium isotope through these barriers uh, just in, and, and that meant it was enormously expensive. So the technology evolved and most players in the world, the Russians, the Europeans, the Chinese, the Iranians <laughs> pivoted to something called gas centrifuge technology. Our new machines, which you can see on our website, uh, have that uranium enrichment technology by gas centrifuge. It is, as you indicate, much lower operating cost much more efficient in the use of electricity. And um, uh, just to complete the kind of spectrum, the other thing that's been kind of the nirvana out there, if you will, the, the fusion uh, in terms of uh, the high promise but challenging in engineering is laser isotope separation, which has a lot of attractive theoretical attributes, but the engineering has traditionally been rather challenging. And in fact, the company I now lead spent a lot of money uh, and ended, ended up giving up on it a long time ago. So as as we're you know we're talking about this these new reactor designs, and I you know if there was a book that was written and I saw he was on uh, Joe Rogan I can't think of the guy's name but the book was called I think it was the end of the world is just the beginning, and it was all about deglobalization and he was sort of a futurist, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name I'll think of it, but one of the things he he wrote about was that sort of clean energy in terms of renewables that there that it's it can't solve the problem that it it just that you really have to have nuclear uh that really nuclear is the only way and and you know if for example California were to go to nothing but electric vehicles they can't produce the power for it and, you know, then we have all of the problems that we're now finding out with, you know, the the production of lithium ion batteries in China. And so there's a whole bunch of problems. But nuclear is something that we, we can do in this country. And we, we're not dependent upon the Chinese or anybody else or anybody that uses slave labor. And so as we think about it, can you help? Because there's this natural... Um, and I, you know, I, I mostly write about nuclear weapons and I've been writing a lot about the use of low yield weapons and what do those weapons effects look like? And people have this innate fear, you know, when it comes to weapons, for example, that one nuclear weapon, a low yield, let's say a 10 kiloton weapon is, you know, it's, it's going to devastate the earth. And so part of what I've been writing about is here's what those weapons effects actually look like. And Nuclear energy is kind of the same, like when people say, oh, we had this terrible accident at Three Mile Island. But then when you actually tell them how much, uh, you know, radiation was released, they're like, oh, geez, I didn't know it was that that little of a, an amount. And so are we going to be at a point, do you think, where people say, oh, I, I, I understand nuclear energy. I understand the safety of it. It's not the threat, you know, that. I thought, uh, you know, these new reactors are not Fukushima reactors. This is not Chernobyl. Is is the industry working to sort of get those ideas out there? 
Yes, but I have to say in terms of self-criticism, uh, we have not made as effective a case as I, I wish uh, we had. And the, gosh, Adam, there's so much uh, truth packed into that question of yours. I kind of don't know where to begin. Let me just throw out a couple of things here. To your first point, look, we need every jot and tittle of carbon-free power that we can. The enemy is carbon. That's the, the carbon is going to destroy the planet. You cannot get to net zero without doubling or probably tripling nuclear by 2050. You just can't. And, you know, the first 20 or 30 percent you pick up with renewables is easy pickings. But problem with renewables is like what happens in the monsoon season? What happens at night? What happens when the wind stops blowing? You need and and those thinking people look at the book Taming the Sun by Varun Savarm loves solar tells you you need firm dispatchable power to back it up to maximize the contribution even of the renewables. So nuclear is the best friend to renewables and should be looked at that way. You have to backstop renewables with and you don't have enough batteries to make up the difference. You don't have the high voltage transmission to make up the difference. And to think that three magic beans and a solar panel solve the problem is just it's just magical thinking. So we need to be serious about that. Point one, point two, all of the other things. Nobody looks at the all in aspects. So you talk about the levelized cost of electricity of wind or solar being very low, but you got to add in storage. You got to add in transmission, and we're not. Uh, third, land use. I come from Ohio. When they were looking at shutting down three of the nuclear plants in Ohio to replace that carbon-free power, you'd have had to cover the state with solar panels. There's, If you want to bring power to Guam, there's not an inch left. So materials use. To make wind and, and solar, you use, what, what is a wind turbine blade made out of? Plastic is made out of oil. Nobody does these kind of all-in calculations. So we got to be better about it. But honestly, the third and last point I'll make, because you know, you got a limited amount of time here, is the nuclear industry itself has got to, got to perform better. We have to be on time. We have to be on budget. We have to execute, execute, execute. And I think creating that kind of record of success will help provide more, I think, um, uh, traction to some of these very other uh, obvious arguments. I guess the last thing to say in terms of safety, look, accidents are terrible, but no one died at Three Mile Island. Fukushima killed 18,000 people from the tsunami and the earthquake, not from the radiation. Chernobyl, the best numbers I've seen are like 4,000 people. We kill millions of people, kill them you know, with, with fossil fuels every year. Uh, and like Bill Gates put in his book, you know, let's just say in year X, we had 40,000 road deaths from cars. Well, obviously we banned driving, right? Yeah. No, we put in airbags and rear view mirrors on the right side and seat belts and all that. kind. Of, so we just have to be smart about it. We have to execute. And I, I think some of these kind of atavistic emotional concerns, I think will begin to fade away. And in fact, they are. There's a whole lot of polling data, uh, Adam, that, that will tell you more and more people realize, hey, climate change is the problem and nuclear must be part of the solution. I, I agree with you. Well, we're at that time of show where we have to take a quick break. You're listening to Nuclecast and we'll be right back. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the AMLA Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. And we're back and we're talking to Dan Poneman. We're having a great discussion. Now, we are getting towards the end of the show, but I wanted to, before before we move on, you've got a new book out, Double Jeopardy. And I wanted to give you an opportunity for those listeners who might not have read it, and I know almost everybody has, I'm sure. But for those who haven't, tell us about the book. 
Well, if you're looking for it, just look in the insomnia column of the bookstore and it'll be right there. Uh, no, well, my obsession since I've been uh, a summer intern in college has been on the intersection between security issues and energy issues. I just think it's fascinating. Books, many good books like by Dan Jurgen have been written about this whole subject. And to me, having spent five and a half years as Deputy Secretary of Energy, something that kept coming up and I kept worrying about, kept me up at night, is this twin challenge facing humanity, two existential threats, catastrophic climate change and catastrophic nuclear exchange. And how could we take steps to solve both problems? And specifically, if we need a lot more nuclear, which I believe we need to solve climate change, how can we have lots more nuclear power around the world without having lots more bombs go with it? And so that's what the book is about. And it comes up with 12 practical steps. Uh, they're not all about nuclear. Some of them had to do with carbon pricing and so forth. But some of it does call for a renewed focus on safe nuclear power and, frankly, the need for the United States to play a leadership role. Because I'm sorry to say, Adam, but over the last several decades, the United States completely squandered our leadership. We used to dominate world fuel markets in uh, enriched uranium. We've gone from the world's biggest exporter to the world's biggest importer. We used to dominate everybody wants U.S. technology, but through a number of things, we've frankly made ourselves rather difficult to deal with. And therefore, guess what? After uh, Westinghouse finished building four reactors in China, the U.S. order book internationally for reactors was zero. The Russian order book was $130 billion. They bring money to the table. They bring finance to the table. They bring assistance to the table. And, you know, we like bring a knife to a gunfight. So, so I wrote this book because I wanted to help people think about how to solve these problems in practical ways uh, and get, frankly, the United States back into the leadership role that, that we used to enjoy without challenge. And the last thing I'll say about it, this intersects with everything we care about. It intersects with energy security. It intersects with climate change uh, and fighting the uh, catastrophic consequences of that. It's about supply chain vulnerability. Every time you read about semiconductors and the CHIPS Act, the same logic applies when it comes to enriched uranium. And, uh, and not least, uh, when you export nuclear fuel and you export nuclear reactors, you get to write the rules of nonproliferation. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I would not want any country more than I want the United States writing the global nonproliferation rules, because if we have a nuclear weapons incident, it's just as devastating to the planet as a nuclear accident at a reactor. Now, just out of curiosity, is new American reactor technology, because we haven't been building reactors. We've been, you know, Idaho National Labs has been working on, you know, developing new designs, but the Russians have been building them and the Chinese have been building them. Do we have better technology for reactors, better, safer, more efficient, or do they have the better technology? Well, look, I, I am not literally and figuratively on the inside of all those other technologies, but that having been said, I have supreme confidence that when it comes to technology, the United States is second to none on generation three and on generation four. And don't take my word for it. I was just in a session uh, yesterday with a, a number of nuclear executives, and they are telling me that they are hearing all over the world, everyone wants U.S. technology. But what we don't have necessarily are all the right financing tools and political support and, uh, you know, frankly, an efficient way of engaging with other countries uh, to uh, to be successful in that. But but we should be. So I think our, our technology is superb and it's getting better. The other thing, as I mentioned before, we, we have to do is we just have to really up our games in terms of execution. The last thing I'll say here is you made a very important point. Uh, the more you do something, the better you get. So uh, in Russia, in China, even in the UAE, when you build a bunch of reactors, each one gets cheaper. So it's not just a matter of small size. It's a matter of how often you can uh, renew the effort. So you said we haven't had a new reactor. We actually are now just finishing. It's coming online. Vo Vogel Power Project. Very exciting. It did run over cost uh, a, a lot. But what happens when you allow a supply chain to collapse over 30 years and the workforce to collapse over 30 years? So I believe, Adam, 
as we get back into it and we start building with a greater pace, we need more reactions to get built faster and faster. And the more we do it, the better we get, the better we get, the lower the cost. And this is one of the things I don't think people often sort of tie together is that the weapon side and the power side have a lot of similar supply chain needs, a lot of similar security concerns. And so it's not that they operate independently of one another. So when they're both up and running, it benefits, you know, one benefits the other and that we can draw on and improve both. Yeah, this is a very important insight. And I invite people to take a look at a, a paper written in 2017 by something called the Energy Futures Initiative, which is led by former Secretary Ernie Moniz. We have in this country an ecosystem between the nuclear Navy and its requirements and the skill sets developed to support it. We have hundreds of uh, ships uh, over history that have been fueled safely with nuclear reactors, not a single incident of fatality. And, and, and we're good at it. And that, in turn, reinforces the commercial side. Uh, footnote to history, the whole U.S. commercial nuclear industry was started by the nuclear Navy. Under the leadership of President Eisenhower, this is, by the way, the 70th anniversary of his famous December 8, 1953 Adams for Peace speech, which laid the groundwork for the system we still operate today. Under his leadership, Admiral Rickover selected a light water reactor technology for the Navy and then gifted it effectively to the commercial sector at Shipping Port, Pennsylvania in 1957. That is the beginning of the whole global nuclear industry. And I might say that's reasonably well known, but less well known is a year earlier in February 1956, President Eisenhower made 40,000 kilograms of enriched uranium available half for domestic, half for international use. That was $1 billion worth of uranium fuel. And uh, that's how the U.S. government, in leveraging its national security requirements, can help solve climate change. Hmm. Well, that's that's certainly a interesting point. Uh, you know, we're at the end of the show, but it, you, I only do this occasionally. I've started to do it more often, but I don't know if you knew this, but I actually have a genie in a bottle that grants three wishes. And I'd like to let you make three wishes from my genie. So if you could use my genie for three wishes related to our topics today, what would those three wishes be? That's a tough one. Okay, I'm going to say uh, number one, to see a tripling of the deployment of nuclear power by 2050 in the hopes of staving off climate disaster. Number two, I would say uh, the restoration of American leadership, not as a matter of vanity or jingoism, but because American leadership means high safety standards and high nonproliferation standards. And that, I've got to say it, coming from where I come from, absolutely requires that the United States invest in resuming uranium enrichment, which is critical to both energy and also nonproliferation. And the third thing I would say is that in bringing this prodigious amount of new clean energy to the world, that all of those people, there are billions who don't have electricity, 600 million in Africa alone. Nobody should be expected not to enjoy a good life. Nobody should be expected to have to inhale wood uh, stoke, uh oven fumes and have lung disease as a consequence. So this is not a matter of pulling the ladder up behind us. But my third wish is to bring prodigious amounts of clean energy in a benign way that does not hurt the planet to all those billions of people who need it and deserve it around the world. All right. Well, Dan Poneman, thanks for joining us on Nuclecast today. Thank you, Adam. It's been really a pleasure to be with you. And thanks to you, the listeners, and on the next episode of Nuclecast. So just a few afterthoughts. I really enjoyed that. First of all, Dan Poneman, great guy, nice guy, super easy interview. Uh, some of his, you know, his experience in the 
Bush administration because nonproliferation, that's not really what I've paid that much attention to. It's not been my focus. I'm focused on weapons. And so it was interesting to hear his perspective on trying to get that ATU out of the collapsing Soviet Union and then to talk about where we are as a nation and to trying to reconstitute our ability to enrich. And then what does that mean for power? And, you know, just where are we going? I, to be honest with you, I've found it a fascinating interview. I just thought it was, you know, it's really interesting. And it, it's a topic, the power and enrichment side that I have not traditionally spent much time on. So, you know, I found that, you know, this is really interesting. And I've sort of come to the conclusion that weapons and power sort of go hand in hand, that they're not sort of totally separated like I probably a year ago would have said. So really interesting. Glad glad we had Dan Poneman on. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Frumthal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at NuclearCast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.